Welcome to Rebel Speak and Be Encouraged. And today I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking about how we work with people whose spiritual spirituality seems to threaten our own. So when we see things that we think are dangerous or something's, uh, we're quick to find fault because we believe it's righteous to find fault. And we're oriented to uh, righteousness in that manner. And I'm, I want to read from chapter 22 of the book of Joshua. It's a really fas fascinating study because what happens as they start approaching, so they, they come around and like if this is Cana, the land of Cana that they're going to inherit, and here's the Jordan River. <laughs> and when they come around this way, they ask for permission to pass through the land, but the kings defy it. And then certain tribes, when they go through it, they actually come to God they are go to Moses. I'm, I'm not remembering the details. Pretty sure it's through Moses. But they ask for the land. And it's two tribes and then a half tribe of Manasseh. So half of Manasseh is over here and the other half is on that um, western side. But there's these eastern tribes that they say, we like this land, we'd like to stay here. And Moses, Moses says, that's fine, but you have to promise you'll fight with all your might. You won't just kind of enjoy that you, you, your land, they didn't have to fight for it. Like that's the kind of land where there's a way that God works on their behalf when they're being attacked. They, they're just asking for passage through, but the, the nations there attack them and then the land, they win and they have the land. And they fought it together as a, as a whole nation. So when they want to stay in that land, Moses is like, okay, but you have to come and fight hard with your brethren as they fought for you, you'll, you'll fight for them, but you can have that land. And so there's the, the, the those are called the Eastern tribes because they're on the Eastern side of the Jordan and the, the original land of promises on the Western tribe of the Jordan. And, um, and then there's a, 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 a miscommunication. I want to get to that in chapter 22 of the book of Joshua. Um, so the Lord gave to Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors and they conquered it and settled there. So we're at the end of the fighting, okay? The, the, not the fighting on those eastern tribes, but the fighting for the promised land. The, the fighting has, the engagement has happened, and Yahweh gave them rest on every side, just as he had solemnly promised their ancestors. They've achieved something that's been out there in the story for hundreds of years, and it's been acquired. None of their enemies could stand against them, for Yahweh helped them conquer all their enemies, all of the good promises that Yahweh had given Israel came true. This is how God sees that, by the way. I just want to say that. that we're like, oh my gosh, that was such a fight. Oh my gosh, that was so delayed. And God's saying, look, everything I said to you came true. <laughs> like getting our hearts, seeing things through God's like, no, this is legendary. We're like, whoa, I wanted to click my heels three times and say, there's no place like home. And God's like, where in the world does that happen? <laughs> but anyway... Here's chapter 22. Then Joshua, he's in charge of everything here, called together the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Okay, so the tribe of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. He told them, you have done as Moses, the servant of Yahweh, commanded you, and you have obeyed every order I have given you. you they've been so faithful. They've been faithful to their the, 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 their their sibling tribes that had to fight a really hard fight to secure their land. You have not deserted the other tribes, even though the campaign has lasted for such a long time. See, their family is, is living a, a peaceful, tranquil life on the other side, on the eastern side of the Jordan River. But they didn't abandon, and they could have. But they didn't. You have been careful to obey the commands of Yahweh, your God, up to the present day. And now Yahweh your God has given the other tribes rest as he promised them. So go home now to the land Moses, the servant of Yahweh, gave you on the east side of the Jordan River. But be very careful to obey all the commands and the law that Moses gave to you. Okay, and one of the things that we want to get really clear in our, our mind is the normalcy of synchronism, of um, worship, synchronistic worship. That believing in one God is odd and it like you can read people sometimes think it took 
Israel a long time that when God comes to Abraham and Abram and Sarai and says, I want to make a nation and I want to be your God, it's a really foreign way of thinking. It's a very, very foreign way of thinking. And it's difficult to establish. And, and the temptation to build altars and worship other things that are more that feel more immediate than the, just one God. Like, like it's kind of saying, I don't know, this could be cross, but like if someone said there's only one medicine and, and everyone has, no, I've got this medicine for this and I've got this for that and this cure for that. And then you're thinking, well, it's a little boring having only one and I'm really in immediate need I've got an elbow ache and I, I, I want to take something specific to elbow ache like it, it, it's a foreign way you want to always understand how incongruous to their experience in Egypt how incongruous to their understanding of power a, a single worship but God's I want to I feel through harshness through harshness like no when you get it wrong I'm going to show you it's wrong all through, also through kindness, through manna, through water, like God's been wooing them and also showing them, no, I won't tolerate you looking to other things than trusting me. Like you diversifying your spirituality won't work with me. And so there's been this, this growing and this becoming, this, this kind of fledgling understanding of monotheism. So go home now to your land and be very careful to obey all the commands and the law that Moses gave to you. Love the Lord your God. Walk in all his ways. Obey his commands. Be faithful to him and serve him with all your heart and all your soul. That sums it up. So Joshua blessed them and sent them home. Now Moses had given the land of Bashan to the half tribe of Manasseh east of the Jordan. The other half of the tribe was given land west of the Jordan. As Joshua sent them away, he blessed them and said, Share with your relatives back home the great wealth you have taken from your enemies. Okay, they've, got, they've got their victory wealth that they've gained for fighting with their tribal brothers, their tribal siblings um, west of the Jordan. Share with your relatives back home the great wealth you have taken from your enemies. Share with them your large herds of cattle, your silver and gold, your bronze and iron, and your clothing. This is the celebration. Go home and live in the fullness of who you are. And, and, and there's a reward for how you fought alongside us. So the men of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh left the rest of Israel at Shiloh in the land of Canaan. And Shiloh is that, I'm pretty sure, the earliest place of worship there. So they, they leave them there and they leave for the eastern side of the Jordan. And they started the journey back to their own land of Gilead, the territory that belonged to them according to the Lord's command through Moses. But while they were still in Canaan, okay, they're still, they haven't crossed the river. Before they crossed the Jordan River, Reuben Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh built a very large altar near the Jordan River at a place called Geliloth. Okay, so they build an altar. And here's what I want to think about today. This is more of a thinking through scripture thing, but... Um, they build an altar, and it's kind of, well, what does that mean? But no one asks that question. Everyone presumes to know what it means to build an altar. And that presumption, what does it mean when you worship like that? I presume to know what you're worshiping in that manner means. I presume to know. I presume to come to conclusions about your behavior. I presume to understand your motivation. I presume in all these ways, and it gets us in huge trouble because we're quick to judge and we're not very gracious in our judgment. We're quick to, to see each other in the worst possible light and to come to conclusions that if I were to have behaved that way, that's what that would have meant. That was such a huge part of my early years of marriage for both of us, that a person behaving in the manner that the other was behaving, it, it only could mean one thing and it wasn't very nice. And we were wrong. We were both very, very wrong many, many times. But we learned and we grew. All right. So they, while still in Cana, while still in the land, the promised land, they haven't crossed, they build a large, a very large altar. Okay. When the rest of Israel heard they had built the altar at Galiloth, west of the Jordan River, in the land of Canaan. Okay, you're going to see this. It's going to be all here. We don't want to mess with God. When God's mad, 
right? There's been Achan, the land of Achan. Like when God's man mad, far more than just the guilty party, like all of the rest of us pay a price. We don't want your mistake. We don't want your mistake on our lives. We don't want it. So they're going to react. And I, I think that so often we're like, I'm offended. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't want to be associated with the way you're worshiping. I don't want to be associated with the ways that the way you worship makes mistakes. I, 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 I'm going to really call my distance on you. I'm going to really disown you. I'm going to really disavow you. I'm, I'm going to really separate because I don't want to be near the cost you're going to pay for the sin that you are incurring. Okay, so the whole assembly gathered. Um, yes, the whole assembly gathered at Shiloh and prepared to go a war to war against their brother tribes. Now also remember in the Old Testament, how you treat your brothers, even if it's distant, Edomites, distant. Okay, how, this is the book of Obadiah, these distant, they just seem so long ago, what do they matter? It's like, no, you didn't treat your brothers right. Even when God's angry and saying there's gonna be judgment in the land, you should have behaved like brothers. You shouldn't have jumped quickly upon the judgment. There's this expectation of how we stand for one another in familial relationships. Wow. First, however, they sent a delegation led by Phineas, son of Eleazar the priest. They crossed the river to talk with the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. So the tribes that those, the two and a half tribes have moved on. They're across the river. They cross the river to talk with them. They seek them out for understanding. And this is so important. It's so good that they did this. So often, I, I think we just judge and we, and we feel so secure. Like somehow my judgment's going to make me a more righteous person. Me judging you has me dislodged from you and more righteous than you. Versus at any level, not just pretend pursuing, but listening and understanding the behavior that I'm seeing, right? That we can talk about toxic, whatever, toxic spirituality. I see in you toxic spirituality. I see you in dangerous spirituality and I'm going to judge you. That's how I'm going to preserve my cleanliness. Even though you're a brother or sister in Christ, we should be, be behaving just the opposite. Make every effort to keep that bond of peace. But no, I'm going to feel good about myself by, by being distanced. So whatever price you pay, I don't want to come near to paying it. So when they arrived in the land of Gilead, they said to the tribe of Reuben, oops, I, I just skipped a verse here. They crossed the river to talk with the tribes of Reuben, Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh. In this delegation were 10 high officials of Israel, one from each of the 10 tribes and each a leader within the family division of Israel. So it's, it's serious and they approach it seriously. When they arrived in the land of Gilead, they said to the tribes of Reuben, Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh, the whole community of Yahweh demands to know, listen to this language, why you are betraying the God of Israel. How could you turn away from Yahweh and build an altar in rebellion against him? We've seen what you've done and we know how to read it. And we're going to read it. We're going to interpret it exactly as we see it. You know, there's no gray here because goodness, we're all black and white. And you, you're in bad standing. And listen to this. Was our sin at Peor not enough? We are not yet fully cleansed of it. Even after the plague that struck the entire assembly of Yahweh, we still suffer from the sins of our people. Why would you do this? And yet today you are turning away from following Yahweh. See that conclusion? You are turning away from following Yahweh, the presumption being rightly. You are following Yahweh in a way that's going to offend Yahweh and, and make us all pay a price we don't want to pay. Why are you behaving so badly? If you rebel against Yahweh today, he will be angry with all of us tomorrow. We're all going to pay a price for your bad behavior. If you need the altar because your land is defiled, then join us on our side of the river where Yahweh lives among us in his tabernacle. Okay, if you think that you're not spiritually, you can't handle the land you live in spiritually, come back and join us because the tabernacle's here. The place of God's residence is here. But God has blessed them, by the way. And we will share our land with you. That's, that's, that's a good offer there. Okay, if you think you can't cope with what, if you think there's a curse there that you need to make all sacrifices to God in your land, then um, come live with us. 
don't do that. Don't, don't, don't make sacrifices. It's one, we don't sacrifice any old place. We don't behave any old way. We don't take our spirituality casual. We don't relate to God in the ways that we kind of see fit and just kind of do our own thing. This, this, this um, monotheism is quite strict. We want to get it right. And you need to get it right too. You need to get it right too. Come home if you can't get it right in your land. We will share our land with you, but do not rebel against Yahweh. Or, listen to this, draw us into your rebellion by building another altar for yourselves. Don't draw us into your shame. Don't draw us into your sinful practices. Don't draw our children into your sinful practices. Don't do that. There is only one true altar of Yahweh our God. This is a true statement. There is only one true altar of Yahweh our God. Didn't God punish all the people of Israel when Achan, a member of the clan of Zerah, sinned by stealing the things set apart for Yahweh? You cannot lightly handle the things that are set apart for God, which would be God's altar. He was not the only one who died because of that sin. This is their concern. What will, what will be the fallout of your behavior? Your behavior could easily diminish our gains. Your behavior can easily diminish our standing. There's something so wrong about your behavior and it's threatening to us as we see it, as we understand it, as we perceive with our eyes and come to conclusions with our heart and mind. Then the people of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered these high officials, Yahweh alone is God. Yahweh alone is God. Say it twice. We have not built the altar in rebellion against Yahweh. If we have done so, do not spare our lives this day. But Yahweh knows, and let all Israel know too. You're not seeing rightly that we have not built an altar for ourselves to turn away from Yahweh, nor will we use it for our burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings. We're not going to be doing that. If we have built it for this purpose, may Yahweh himself punish us. You're seeing wrongly. And the conclusions you've drawn are really wrong. And you've underestimated us, which happens a lot when we judge each other. We often underestimate what all's going in another person's life, what all's happening spiritually, the terrain, the spiritual terrain of their life and their land, and what their actions mean and say about their relationship with Yahweh. We often underestimate what's going on and the depth of their heart and their mind and their thinking and what they're about and why they're doing things in the complicated way that they're doing it. We just say, oh, it's religion. Oh, they're being religious. So much more can be going on. Oh, 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 they're so emotional. They're just leaning on emotionality. So much more is going on. Our expectations are often so small on behalf of one another when they should be. I keep thinking of, I think it's Colossians when, no. When does Paul say that you're so, so quick to judge me and you're giving such a bad witness to me, but when I get to, when I stand before Christ, I'm going to brag about you. I'm going to speak of your excellence. I'm going to speak of your excellence. I'm going to speak of your excellence. I'm going to brag about you. We're, we're, I, I'm not going to brag about them. No, I don't want to be identified with them. No, I don't want to, I don't, mm -mm, mm -mm, I need my distance. You know, you see things like where people get together and they do things spiritually and they're like, oops, oops, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was in relationship with this person that worships God really rather well. Like what? Anyway, on we go. If we have built it for this purpose, may Yahweh himself punish it. If we built it for offerings that are not in the tabernacle, May God punish us. We have built this altar because we fear that in the future, your descendants will say to ours, what right do you have to worship Yahweh, the God of Israel? Mm, I'm going to read on a bit. Yahweh has placed the Jordan River as a barrier, barrier between our people and your people. You have no claim to Yahweh, and your descendants may make our descendants stop worshiping Yahweh. 
you over time, right? We see that with all of a sudden what the Pharaoh forgets the people, right? These kind of presumptions, tacit agreements over time can run out. We've put this here as a statement of who we are in relationship to you. That's what this altar is about. That your children not someday say to our children, you can't come into this land anymore and worship. You're not really a part of us. Your descendants may make our descendants stop worshiping Yahweh. So we decided to build the altar, not for burnt sacrifices. See, right there's the, the wrong presumption. There's a presumption that's an error of how they're behaving or how they're planning on behaving or what, what behavior is seen behind the actions. What um, bad, faulty behavior is being associated with the actions that are being seen? That's the problem. The presumption of behavior, of bad behavior, that's implied or tied to in the mind of those Western tribes with the behavior of the built altar, it's not there to burn so sacrifices. It's a memorial. I just love this. I have loved it. Mm. it. I've loved it since a Bible study where that's when it really just jumped out at me with so much power and authority. It will remind our descendants and your descendants. This is a memorial, a reminder that we too have the right to worship Yahweh at his sanctuary. It's, it's to keep things right so that we can worship rightly, that we not be cut off from what is legitimately ours, that we can worship Yahweh at his sanctuary with our burnt offer sacrifices and peace offerings. And then your descendants will not be able to say to ours, you have no claim to Yahweh. If they say this, our descendants can reply, look at this copy of Yahweh's altar that our ancestors made. Here is a memorial that tells you and declares who we are, that we're a part of you. It is not for burnt offerings or sacrifices. It's a reminder of the relationship. I want you to get this. I love it. It is a reminder of the relationship both of us have with Yahweh. It's a statement of who we are, who we are as children of Israel. It's a statement of who we are. It's a statement of identity. It's, it's a behavior that reminds us of who we are in Christ. That's a shift I just made there. But so often we are critical of ways that people experienced, have experienced themselves in Christ and continue to experience them in self, themselves in Christ through that familiar of knowing, right? As Paul says, why are you so quick to abandon the ways that you've met Christ? There's different ways. I'm not talking about vagueness. I'm talking about enculturation of, of worship and the behaviors that are familiar that help awaken our heart to the reality of worship of the Father through the person of Jesus Christ in a world of billions of people, a God that delights, right? Delights, that wow, has established creativity and the evidence of creativity and diversity loudly throughout creation. And yet, right, they can't worship wrongly. But how quick we are to see the altar and say it's bad when we don't understand the point of the thing, the memorial aspect of it. It is a reminder of the relationship both of us have with the Lord, Yahweh. Far be it from us to rebel against Yahweh or turn away from him by building our own altar for burnt offering, grain offering, or sacrifices, detestable behaviors. Only the altar of Yahweh, our God, that stands in front of the tabernacle may be used for that purpose. They know the truth. You know, do people ask and do they hear? Sometimes I, I think people don't even hear when someone's speaking just clear as day truth. They're speaking spiritual truth. Oh, nope, 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 nope. Everything, everything I see in your behavior looks very questionable to me. And, and here your life's witnessing, witnessing to the intimacy and the love, the, the, the Holy Spirit witness of Christ at work in your life. The fruit, right? What do they look for? They look for when they hear about the fruit in the Gentiles' lives. They, they shift a lot of criteria. And yet there's some things. You can't, you can't take the reality that we... Uh, procreate through sexuality. You can't, you can't rewrite that reality. You can't rewrite that one. 
When Phineas and the priests and the high officials heard this from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they were satisfied. Phineas, son of Eliezer, the priest replied to them, Today we know Yahweh is among you. They listened and their hearts were moved. I'm, I'm really praying for long-term hard-heartedness to melt on behalf of one another. Mm. Today, <laughs> we know Yahweh is among you because you have not sinned against Yahweh as we thought. We were wrong. Instead, you have rescued Israel from being destroyed by the Yahweh. Do you see that? See, if we had precluded you, we would have been destroyed. If we had not let you worship rightly down through the generations, this is this is long time, long term vision. This is not that thing where I'm defending my familiar and you need to join my familiar or you are a cultic. Or your long term behavior is so dead. It's not, it's, it's, it's old wineskin. You need to liven it up or I don't know. There, there's just ways that our hearts can grieve God because we don't dialogue long enough to hear the joy of one another's relationship, of who one another is in their worship and, and, and the ways that they've learned and inherited and, and gone about their worship reality and, and know God in those actions. Know God in those familiar expressions. You have rescued Israel from being destroyed by Yahweh. Then Phineas, son of Eliezer, the priest, and the ten high officials left the tribes of Reuben and Gad in Gilead and returned to the land of Canaan to tell the Israelites what had happened. And all the Israelites were satisfied. I hope we can be satisfied and praised God and spoke no more of war against Reuben and Gad and they've dropped the name the half tribe of Manasseh and the people of Reuben and Gad named the altar witness for they said it is a witness between us and them that Yahweh is our God too Yahweh is our God too open your ears to the witness of the story of brothers and sisters lives even if you're like I I I don't know. I wish more for you. I wish some of this for you. Or we we can always say, huh, I found this. Or we're always free to speak, but we're not free to conclude when the name of Christ is being worshipped and honored and righteousness is in the land. Mm. That's faulty. It's faulty. And this is a beautiful chapter, a beautiful chapter to meditate and ponder and be encouraged to to walk that mile right walk that mile into a brother and sister's worship story and learn and hear how they experience the salvation and love of god through the traditions and the ways of worship they know the the, the stuff that's working so well that feeds their soul and brings joy to they and their household be blessed be encouraged <laughs>